everybody. My name is Evan. And I'm Jonathan. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Tackling Basketball Podcast. We have a very busy but exciting agenda for you today. Um, we all know Jonathan is uh, on cloud nine right now, but we will get into the reason why <laughs> here in just a sec. We will start out, of course, with our GOAT and Dick of the Week. Jonathan, who is your GOAT for this week? I mean... We're going to get into why I'm happy pretty quick here because the Denver Nuggets are NBA champions. This is something that um, a lot of Denver fans even never thought would happen. Um, Obviously, a lot of uh, national media never assumed it would happen, even this year. Um, And it's just, um, man, what a journey uh, to overcome injuries, to... uh, Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. that were plaguing us the last couple of years to um, just draft and develop this team, um, built not bought, uh, as we like to say, and then to watch just an absolute dominant performance throughout these whole playoffs. I called it, um, just want to say, after game one in our podcast, our uh, super hot take to end the episode, I said, Nuggets are only losing four games this playoffs. And guess what happened? The Nuggets went on to lose (laughs) only four games this entire playoffs. And, I mean, it's just a spectacular show of dominance and uh, will go down in history. I I think that the Nuggets have a chance to levy this now into a, uh, a little bit of a dynasty, too. So, super excited to have been there. Super excited for our future. Just what a day. Yeah, congratulations to you and the city of Denver. Uh, hopefully the parade doesn't get too too crazy on Thursday, but I guess we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, for my go to this week, um, it's got to be the MLS and even more specifically Inter-Miami um, coming off of their signing of Lionel Messi, um, essentially stealing him out from under the Saudi Arabian league where Cristiano Ronaldo and Benzema went to play in their twilight years. Um, Everybody thought it was pretty much all guaranteed that Messi would go there. Saudi offered him $1.2 billion for two years, um, which is just insane. And this is of course also coming after Saudi essentially bought professional golf in America um, with live in the PGA. So it was, we were starting to see Saudi kind of just take over sports in general but here we go Messi deciding to come to the MLS instead um the MLS has been growing at a rapid pace uh as of this past year they are actually actually now the 10th highest grossing league sports league in the world which is crazy for them they keep adding teams to the league and Messi coming here is just going to make that go even faster um every single game that he's a part of is going to be sold out ticket prices are going to be crazy no one here in the u.s is going to want to miss a chance to see Lionel messi play in person um and hopefully this now begins to draw in even more players from the premier league from other european leagues to come play here um obviously we would love to have them in their prime don't think the mls is quite there yet but having messi is fantastic um it is even crazier than when the MLS got David Beckham or Wayne Rooney, Rooney or Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Messi's the GOAT or your runner-up GOAT, whichever way you land. So awesome, awesome stuff for the MLS. Yeah, I mean, easily the biggest signing in MLS history. Um, has a somewhat argument to be the biggest signing in like American sports history. Um, mm-hmm. just an absolute legend. And, uh, I don't know if we were able to beat that offer from the Saudis or if he just, um, had too much of a conscience or something, but whatever it was, <laughs> we are going to be so glad to watch him, um, play in this league. But moving on to my dick of the week, um, it is one very special ESPN analyst named Lisa Salters. Um, I'm not sure, and I I don't know how to Google this, but I'm not sure if a trophy ceremony has ever started with booze, and it was because Lisa Salters was the one handing off the trophy (laughs) just two and a half weeks after coming out in front of the world and saying, hey, 
That Jokic guy is pretty good. I've never ever watched him ever once in my life until today. <laughs> <laughs> you get paid so much money to be in the sports world and you've never watched one of the greatest players of this generation just out of laziness out of uh i don't even know and so she was greeted to boo birds and then shortly after when uh Kronky was the first one to interview with her um got a little bit of immediate payback by uh, whispering into her ear instead of into the microphone just a real weird situation there but um yeah, Denver was electric the entire game during the trophy ceremony as well. She was the reason that you heard a single boo that night. Yeah, screw that lady. Yeah. <laughs> um, on to my pick of the weekend. This one is going to be a little bit more ranty than we usually get on this. Um, my dick of the week is John Morant's PR team or his agent or – Whoever it is that this past week decided to put out the statement claiming that the gun that John Morant had in his recent video was a fake gun. This is just crazy to me. I personally don't believe it for a second. Um, There's just so many things like why would Ja issue that apology statement? Why would they not immediately come out and say it was a fake gun just to get ahead of it? This very much to me feels like they are trying to create an excuse for the NBA PA to get a reduced suspension from whatever Adam Silver hands to jaw of just creating that sense of doubt. Cause this is likely something that the NBA really can't confirm or deny. Like it's, it would be hard for them to actually prove this. Um, and the snippet of the video that you see though, it, there's nothing on that gun that would indicate it to be fake. So it's, either a very realistic looking fake or it's an actual gun. And I believe it's an actual gun, but I'll, I'll I'll play devil's advocate here for a second. Um, suppose it is true that it is fake. I, that's no better in my mind for jaw. It just, it, a, it would look like he's absolutely mocking the commissioner and the NBA league office of joking around with a toy gun. Um, And off of that, why the heck does a 23-year-old have a toy gun? He's 23, not 12. It just seems weird and dumb. And at the end of the day, it's all about optics. I mean, for for the NBA, yes, obviously having a real gun in that situation would be endangering those in the car and potentially people outside walking around the car. So that does make it slightly worse. But the reason the NBA is upset about this is how it looks. It's John Morant trying to look like a gangster, trying to look tough, trying to appear as though he's a thug. And whether it's a real gun or not, that appearance does not change. So I think even if it was a fake gun, which, again, the NBA won't be able to prove or falsify, I don't think this is going to change the outcome of whatever suspension Adam Silver has lined up for him. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, like Shannon Sharp pointed out in his show, um, it is um, dangerous. It shows a bad image, and it, it's, it puts himself in danger um, to do this as well. It makes other people feel unsafe. Even if it's a toy gun, all of these things are still true. Um, yeah. To quote one of the uh, greatest shows of all time, Community, uh, 100% of fake gun-related accidents, the victim is the one with the fake gun. Like, you just got to be smart, man. Yeah. It's not worth, like, risking yourself. Um, It's not worth damaging your image, and it's not worth intimidating other people just because... (laughs) I don't even know what the point of owning it would be. I don't know what the point of pulling it out in the middle of a car would be, but it's yeah, foolish. It doesn't make any sense. And then then Tyron would do his friend's reaction, like it, how quickly his friend pulled away the phone. Like that, you don't do that if it's a fake gun. So I think his PR team is full of crap here. Moving on from that, I've said enough, a uh, little long-winded there. Um, 
We'll then turn our focus back to the reason why Jonathan's so happy today. The NBA Finals Nuggets coming out with the championship win. Jonathan essentially already do- dove into his excitement for it. But Jonathan, I mean, really, how is how is Nuggets Nation feeling? And how are you feeling about the Nuggets' chances of pulling off a repeat next year? You know, we are all um, mostly stuck in celebration. I'd say the second most predominant feeling right now is pulling out receipts, uh, <laughs> yelling at everyone over the past couple of years who uh, said we would never make it or said that this team wasn't what they are, what we always knew that they were. Um, and uh, the third predominant feeling is probably, I think we can do it again. Like, you look at our five starters, we have them all um, on contract through the end of 2025. We have um, Bruce or Christian Brown on contract as well for the next three years. Uh, Bruce Brown has a player option that he'll probably let go of, um, and we'll have to fight real hard to keep him. But, I mean, this team is set up with both youth and, um, like, well-thought-out um, contract periods to ensure that this roster should be able to hold together and should be able to deliver at this level again. Um, So to answer your last question first, yes, I think they can do it and they should be the favorites. Vegas has them as the favorites right now as well. Um, Implied odds of around 20%, um, which is pretty darn good. I think that's better than the Nuggets have almost ever seen in their existence beyond after like round two of this um, NBA playoffs. Um, but yeah, just an amazing run. Uh, a couple of fun stats. First one from just um, the Western Conference in general. No Western Conference team has won the championships outside of California and Texas since 1979. That was the Seattle Supersonics. Um, so Denver breaking a long streak. We know that this uh, this league has a little bit of a problem with dichotomy um, in that there is none. <laughs> so um, to, to have these small market teams, to have my small market team break out and win a championship is uh, really exciting. And then you look at just, uh, obviously Nikola Jokic was named uh, unanimous finals MVP. Um, he's the latest drafted uh, player to ever win it. My first reaction was, duh. Um, He is the first player in NBA history to ever lead playoffs in total points, assists, and rebounds. Um, And just a whole heap of, like, games throughout these playoffs that no one has ever done. Not even Wilt. Because that was our thing for, like, so long. Jokic is the first since Wilt to do this. No, not even Wilt. Not even Wilt. <laughs> so, we are all ecstatic here about this. Yeah, I bet. And like you said, Nuggets are in a very interesting position because they have everybody under contract. Um, like you said, you'll probably want to try and re-sign Bruce Brown this off offseason. Um, but if they're able to pull that off, really, for next year, they're just looking at needing everybody to stay healthy, which... Uh, in the past has been an issue and luckily this year for them they didn't have that issue but if they can stay healthy again next year yeah they should absolutely be the favorites or up there in the top two or three teams for championship odds yeah i think um the suns are going to be big competition next year having a little bit more time to develop kd i think that uh, both the 76ers and the bucks i expect to do better next year So uh, whoever we meet in the Eastern Conference Finals will probably be a little bit more of a challenge, maybe. Um, And the league's just going to keep getting more entertaining year over year. Uh, I'm super excited for next year, but living in the moment right now. that though we will shift over to our next segment um this is a new one will be kind of a standalone here for a while but uh we're gonna go through some nba hall of fame cases Uh, we thought that would be a fun time here Uh, we won't be discussing 
guys who are shoe wins, you know, LeBron, Steph, KD, those guys are getting in. They're first ballot Hall of Famers. There's no need for Jonathan and I to sit here and discuss <laughs> why they're getting in because everybody knows. Um, we are going to dive into some guys, though, who, you know, whose odds, you know, kind of may be on the border here, who still have something to prove. Some of these guys are more than likely going to get in, and we'll kind of discuss maybe what they need to do further or if they're essentially already in. Um, but with that said, we'll hop into our first guy here, um, Anthony Davis. And Jonathan was kind enough to drop in for us the percentage odds according to basketball reference for each guy. Um, they currently have Anthony Davis at a 98.6% chance to get into the hall. Jonathan, what do you think of that? Do you, would you agree with that percentage? Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing, the only reason that he's like not 100% right now, which 98.6 is effectively 100%, is that he only has four All-NBA appearances, which is almost surprising given like the length of his career to this point and how um, successful he's been throughout. But that said, he also has four All-Defensive appearances and an NBA championship, eight All-Stars. Um, I mean, he is got the resume to make it in and I have no doubt that he'll be first ballot. He, he almost was one that we left off this list because it just felt so short of, to us. Yeah. For sure. He'll he'll be getting in. There's really not much question about it. Um, only thing that would derail him at this point is those injuries, but even then, he's probably already done enough to get in regardless. Um, and probably the same could be said for the next guy, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Ante Kakumpo at 94.9%, um, has a couple of MVPs, has won a ring, absolute dominant force in the league. At at this point, he's about as close to a shoe as you could get. Yeah, I mean, first ballot unanimous. The only reason he's not 100% is because he's somehow still young with all of these accolades. <laughs> like, yeah. How? How? <laughs> He's got a defensive player of the year. This little graphic we have, that's what the uh, the shiny trophy is in the all-defensive team. I didn't have enough room to shove all of his awards onto this screen. Um, so just an absolute legend who had a le- – he's been in the MVP uh, top three for five year- straight years, um, which is pretty rare. And a lot of the reason that he doesn't have another one is voter fatigue. So um, first ballot – easy yeah for sure now we'll start getting into some guys that eh, probably will still be in the hall but there's a little bit more discussion to be had here first one is paul george at 93.6 percent um i personally feel that this is kind of high what do you think jonathan i mean i think the biggest blotch on his record is no nba championships um, he hasn't been with the greatest teams and the greatest surrounding casts other than, I mean, um, Kawhi Leonard obviously is a great running mate. Um, but um, all of the rest of his accolades uh, sort of show um, the kind of player and the kind of legacy that he's had. And I, I think that he probably, I, I'd probably put him right around 90% um, to make the haul. But... Um, yeah, certainly an absolute uh, stud athlete from top to bottom. Yeah, for sure. He's in all likelihood he's going to get in. He he should get in. Um, I just, of course, have a bone to pick with him as a Blazers fan because uh, it's <laughs> it's just fun. It's just fun to hate on Paul George. Yeah, but yeah, you're he's he's been on some not so hot teams and has managed to carry them pretty far um, back when he was on the Pacers the fact that he kept that team relevant for as long as he did is quite impressive um, so more than likely we'll be seeing him in the hall pretty soon after he retires yeah for sure yeah and now to Kyrie Irving at 93.5 percent um Jonathan what what do you think about good old Kyrie here yeah, um, this is one that I think is probably a bit too high. Um, he has uh, his NBA championship came as the second option to potentially the greatest player of all time in his prime. Um, he has only three All NBA appearances. Uh, he did win Rookie of the Year, uh, but 
overall um somewhat of a weaker resume as well as a lot of uh controversy over the last few years and that controversy will probably drive down his likelihood at least of first ballot as well because i mean you have multiple instances where you can probably point to him and say he made his team worse um now does still have a good legacy does still have a um a decent amount of accolades and statistics to back him up um but i'm not saying first ballot i'm probably putting him at around um 80 percent right now to make it if i were picking it yeah i i agree i think since leaving lebron um and trying to be you know the quote-unquote man of a team he has proven that it's he just can't do it. I mean, he tried to do it with Boston, fell short. In Brooklyn, Kevin Durant was the guy, and that didn't work out for him. And then in Dallas, I guess him and Luka were both the man, and that oh, freaking clearly didn't work out. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, he has a propensity for making his team's worth. He might be one of the most toxic locker room guys in the NBA, um, but he is a very skilled player, um, so he definitely has a case to be had. Yeah, for sure. But next up, we have someone who I was really surprised to see at this list, uh, at this point in the list uh, for basketball reference, especially considering a couple of the players that we're going to discuss shortly after him that have worse odds, according to them. Um, and that is Kyle Lowry, um, one time NBA champion, one time All NBA. Six-time All-Star, Olympic gold medalist, but um, overall a fairly bare um, like resume considering the 85.7% odds that Basketball Reference is giving him. What are your thoughts, Evan? Yeah, I think that's a bit high. As much as I love Kyle Lowry, um, he does have a ring. I just don't think he has the accolades. And so I think he'll get in. I don't think he'll be first ballot. Um, so yeah, I I definitely think this is high for him. Yeah, I think he probably gets in, but man, I'm throwing this one down like right around fifty percent. It's kind of a he needs to improve and like show that he can be a leader of the his team. Probably make another few All Stars. Um, see if he can sneak onto the All NBA team once or twice more. Um, but if he retired today, I'm not sure if he does make it. Yeah, for sure. That's definitely going to be a contentious one whenever he does get on the ballot. And that brings up an interesting point, too, that um, we I'll, I'll go ahead and cover right now. This uh, basketballreference.com percentages are based on if they retire today, which makes this number almost more confusing to me. Um We'll see later on that there <laughs> yeah. are a couple of like younger players that um, I'm sure Evan and I will have um, higher opinions of than their percentage, uh, but that's because they're young, and if they retired today, they would like not have a very lengthy or um, accolade-filled career. But Kyle Lowry is sort of um, sort of not there, I think. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Next up, we have Kawhi Leonard, and now you immediately know why I thought um, Kyle Lowry was a little too high. Uh, to say that a five-time All-NBA, two-time Finals MVP, seven-time All-Defensive Team, two-time Defensive Player of the Year is below Kyle Lowry in Hall of Fame probability. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think it's controversial to say that um, Kawhi Leonard is the better player with the better history um, and has the better odds to make it. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of shocked that he wasn't up in the 90s on this. I, I know he's had a lot of injuries, but again, when he's been on the court, he's one of the most dominant forces in the NBA, one of the best two-way players in the NBA, um, has two rings, all NBA teams, Defensive player of the years. I mean, really everything you're looking for in a guy who should be making it into the Hall of Fame. Um, if he continues to kind of be riddled with the injury bug, you know, maybe he 
drops down and isn't a first ballot guy, but in my mind, I think Kawhi is a shoo-in to make the Hall of Fame at some point during his, his run for it. Yeah, I think so, too. And that takes us now to someone who um, has not ever been the star of his team, but does still have quite the resume to show, and that's Draymond Green. Um, obviously, four championships, uh, huge. Eight all-defensive team selections, um, and then a couple of all-NBA uh, Defensive Player of the Year award, four all-stars. Um, I mean, he's got most of his resume in place. He's just never been the number one guy on the team. He's never even been the number two offensive option on his team, save for the Klay Thompson injury season. Um, And uh, this brings up the interesting question of what does it take to make the Hall of Fame? Like, can you do it as a second or third option as a career role player who is probably the single best quote unquote role player of all time but still he was not by any means the star yeah and I think the best comp for Draymond here is probably Dennis Rodman um, kind yeah. of the argument we have with De- Dennis Rodman is that you know Dennis was not the first offensive option or the second hell he probably was he wasn't even the third offensive option <laughs> but he was really kind of the glue of that team. Um, he was a menace on defense, a fantastic rebounder. Um, a lot of things kind of ran through him on the court. And Draymond has kind of been the same thing for the Warriors. I mean, there you can probably make the argument that without Draymond, you know, the Warriors may not have won a couple of those championships. Yeah. And so I think with Dennis Rodman being in the hall, I think Draymond will be in there. I think his 76.8% on there is, is probably about where I'd put him. Um I, you could probably make the case that you know that role player, that you know third, fourth option guy, shouldn't be in there. But I think he deserves it. Like you said, he's quite possibly the best role player the game has ever seen. Um, again, he may not wind up being a first ballot guy, but I think he'll wind up getting in. Yeah, I think those are good points, and I'd have to agree with you. Um, good comp with Dennis Rodman and. Seventy-six percent is probably about right, but um, a couple more years in this league, he uh, he has a chance to bump that up a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And I'll introduce the next one. Let you take the first shot at it, uh, since it, since it's your boy Nikola Jokic um, coming in at seventy-three point nine percent chance. Um, and do you know did this take into account that him now having a ring, or is this pre? Championship. I believe this is pre-championship. Um, I don't okay. think that they updated it that quickly. Fair enough. Well, what do you think your boy's chances are there, Jonathan? <laughs> I mean, legitimately, I think he's in the hall if he retires today. Um, I don't think that he will retire today. I sure hope not. And I think that they'll have a really good chance to go on a run, win another championship, maybe even another two championships. And... Uh, He'll just keep padding this resume. But, I mean, back-to-back MVP has been done so few times. Even just a single MVP, there's only one player who has ever gotten that who is not currently in the Hall of Fame. Um, And to do it twice and not make it would just be egregious. So, uh, I think he's in if he retires today. I think he's in if he retired before the the final game yesterday. <laughs> he's got a hell of a resume for his age and I hope it just continues to grow. Yeah. I would agree. I I'd say at this point um he probably should be at 100%. Maybe you make the case that you put him at like 7 or 97 or something like that just because of the fact that he is young and still has a lot more years to play, but He's in. I mean, like you said, back-to-back MVPs, um, triple-double machine, especially for a guy who plays the center position, has really kind of revolutionized that. Um, took the passing aspect of what Bill Walton had back in the 70s and kind of perfected it and then added shooting threes and scoring at a high volume. So, yeah, I, especially if he winds up tacking another one, 
or two rings onto this resume resume he's in. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. So Yeah, for sure. Oh, next up is uh Jimmy Butler, his opponent from this series. Um listed at seventy three percent, just four behind him. Um and his resume is impressive. I honestly completely forgot that he was all defensive five times in his career, which is an impressive mm-hmm. thing to do, um, especially for a guy who is really genuinely talented on offensive end as well. Um, so, Evan, what do you think about Jimmy Butler's odds? Yeah, I probably – he's at 72% here, which is probably where he should be. Um, again, he kind of has that mark of no rings – against him um, but as we've talked about with other guys he's also never been on that star sided of a team um, I think the fact that he's now carried this heat roster to two championship appearances even without a ring is freaking impressive um, especially this I mean this year probably cements Jimmy Butler's legacy the fact that he took this eight seed heat team and steamrolled through the Eastern Conference is crazy um argument to be had that he is the biggest dog this league has ever seen with just <laughs> his sheer will and I mean just drive to finish teams off so 72 is probably correct um, he again isn't very old so he's still got some years and some time to pad that who knows maybe the Heat will finally grab a ring with Jimmy at some point here but I think he'll be in again maybe not first ballot with how he's currently sitting but he'll get in yeah i mean i think that if he retired today it's probably a little lower than what they have here probably around like 60 percent. but i also think that he uh he's young enough and talented enough and driven enough to continue to build this resume and um continue to take teams where they shouldn't go um especially with such an amazing coach as coach spo so i think his odds are gonna continue to climb over the next couple of years Absolutely. Next up, we have the other member of the uh, Golden State Warriors trio, uh, Clay Thompson, with, again, four championships, just two All-NBA appearances, somehow an All-Defensive Team appearance, which I definitely forgot about. Um, (laughs) And, yeah, um, just a very... uh, He has this weird thing where like he is maybe the second best shooter of this generation and he might not ever get recognized as that because he's always been on the same team as the first best shooter of this generation (laughs) um so i almost wonder if like there will be a little bit of bias against him just having spent his whole career behind steph sort of like we talked about with draymond but also, I think that he has um, sort of got a lot of the same arguments as Draymond. Um, probably agree that his odds are slightly lower at this point, but um, overall, I think he'll make it. How about you? Yeah, I would agree. And uh, to keep the uh, Bulls comps going here, if Draymond is Dennis Rodman, Clay Thompson is Scotty Pippen. I mean, he was the number two to a revolutionary player and was kind of overshadowed for it and I mean Clay has had plenty of games where he has gone out and dropped 50 and rained threes all over the place Um, he has somehow managed to drop 50 while dribbling the ball like three times which shit that should get you into the hall just because of that because that is absolutely crazy But, (laughs) but I think 70s probably about right for Clay. I definitely think those couple of years that he was out due to injuries probably sets him back a little bit, um, especially because that was right in his prime when he should have been wheeling and dealing. So, again, maybe not currently projected at first ballot, but should absolutely be a Hall of Famer. You can't argue against four rings and the contributions that he's made to the Warriors dynasty. Yeah, I agree. So before we move on to our next player, I just want to say, um, or I want to ask you uh, to rank these three guys that we've already covered being uh, Kyle Lowry, Draymond Green, and Clay Thompson. (laughs) Uh, I would probably go Clay Thompson, then Draymond, um, 
and then a bit of a gap, and then Kyle Lowry. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly think I have Draymond above Clay. Um, the defensive uh, contributions are huge um, always, mm-hmm. and I think that that really vaults him up a little bit. But yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, Lowry is still shocking that he is above any of the guys that we've already covered. Um, great player, without a doubt, but I don't think that he deserved to be sitting at like a 78%. I forget now. Yeah, I would agree. Now on to someone who's almost been forgotten in this NBA right now, um, just per the nature of uh, the way the game is played, almost starting to pass him by, despite being like young enough to still uh, contribute. Um, and that's Blake Griffin. Um, five All-NBA selections, six All-Star games, uh, Rookie of the Year award, and none of them within the last uh, year or two. So, Evan, do you see him as sort of a downward trajectory right now? Do you think he makes the haul? Probably downward trajectory. I think overall it's really just going to be 50-50. Um, 54 is probably about right. Because there's a... There's such a knock against him for the fact that that Clippers team he was on with DeAndre Jordan and Chris Paul was never able to go further than they were. Um, you know, it's not like the Paul George situation where you give Paul George ups for what he was able to accomplish with the weak roster around him. You kind of have to knock Blake for what they weren't able to accomplish with that Clippers team. And again, Blake's big thing has been his athleticism, his ability to dunk and he has had some fantastic ones throughout his career, but you don't get into the Hall of Fame because of how many posters you've had in your career. So yeah. I I personally would probably say no. Um, I, I don't really think I see it. Um, I don't really think he should be in there. Um, who knows? Maybe he'll turn it around here in the twilight of his career. Highly doubt it, but for now, I'm going to say no. Yeah, I think I'll agree with you there. I think that his resume, even all of these accolades, are somewhat inflated by um, just the adoration of athleticism rather than like um, his genuine dominance of the league. And, um, I mean, he he is certainly a, um, a good player in this generation and a memorable one but I'm not sure if he's Hall of Fame worthy. Yeah, for sure. All right, now Rudy Gobert. Uh, If you like defense, he's your guy, Uh, but he doesn't bring you a whole lot else um, to the table, as we saw um, over these last couple of seasons. Um, He did have, like, the second or third most um, assets given up for him in a recent trade which maybe that inflates his value maybe that uh maybe the regret of that trade deflates his value a little bit but (laughs) (laughs) what do you think of uh rudy gobert's odds um i think the 21 percent odds here are entirely being held up by his couple of depoys um which is probably fair because you know it's hard to win a defensive player of the year, and it's impressive that he has. But like you said, he's done nothing else besides shut the league down during COVID because he was an idiot. <laughs> um, and then he also he also cried that one time when he didn't make the All Star game. Um, and I think that pretty much summarizes Rudy <laughs> Gobert as a whole. Um, it'll be fun to see him cry when he doesn't get on the ballot or into the Hall of Fame. Uh, I I don't see it. I don't. Even with three Defensive Player of the Year awards, I don't think he deserves it. He just hasn't done anything else. Um, And since his last Defensive Player of the Year, he's kind of gone downhill a little bit. I mean, even with the T-Wolves this year, he really wasn't the defensive force that we've come to know from him. So I just don't see it for Rudy Gobert. Um, He probably will get on the ballot, but I, I don't see him getting in. Yeah, I uh, he'll be on the ballot for sure, um, and he he's got such a weird resume because three defensive players of the year is incredibly impressive. Almost no one's ever done it, and I think I'm pretty sure everyone who has ever done it has made the Hall of Fame. Um, but it's still such um, like 
a lot of those guys to do it are also um, decent offensive contributors in their time, like Dwight Howard and um, Dikembe Mutombo. Um, and it's just, I don't know if I see a very complete game from him and lacking uh, those like championships, lacking the ability to sort of be the number one guy and take his team to that next level might be what holds him back. Yeah, for sure. All right, now uh, we're starting to get into the young guys um, whose odds per basketball reference are mostly low as a result of their youth and um, not having the accolades. Because remember, it's if you retire today, are you in? And I think for all of these guys, the answer is no. But I think that they um, all have an argument at a chance to make it. Uh, starting with Jason Tatum. Uh, currently three All-NBA selections, four All-Star appearances, and um, a couple of decent playoff runs, uh, That, uh, including a... Um, he was named the first ever Eastern Conference Finals MVP. Uh, I don't have that one listed here, but... Um, Evan, what do you think, uh, what does Jason Tatum need to do throughout the rest of his career in order to give himself the best chance of making the Hall of Fame? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if he's able to win a ring, that would, of course, boost things for him. But really, if he just keeps playing the way he's been playing, he will likely wind up in the Hall. Um, Ring or no ring, there's probably an argument to be had that he would be kind of in a similar position to Paul George. Um, It's kind of unfortunate for him, and really the Celtics team, they've had a lot of instability at head coach over the past few years um they've been playing in a lot of different systems so it's there's a pretty reasonable excuse there as to why the celtics haven't been able to go and take it all the way um so i really if he just keeps playing the way he's been playing i i think he's good to go he's so young to accomplish what he has already is outstanding um and i think his game will continue to improve it really has year over year and there's no reason to think that going forward it won't continue to so yeah i agree he's on like you said i think that's a great comp on a paul george trajectory where if he doesn't ever like win a championship if he doesn't ever get his mvp then he has a really good shot of making the hall if he just continues to play the way he has been Um, I think the big difference will be if he can make either of those um, achievements. And I do think he's capable of it. Uh, Just needs to be able to put it together for a full season, stay healthy throughout, and um, have the the strength to lift his uh, team up in the playoffs. Um, But for sure, I think the best chance of um, probably anybody that we're about to discuss of making the Hall. Yeah, for sure. And next up, we have Donovan Mitchell, a single All-NBA selection, a (laughs) slam dunk contest champion, um, (laughs) uh, four All-Star selections, and um, led his team to the four seed in these playoffs, um, which... I think was an impressive feat and the beginnings of a, a the beginnings of a good resume for him uh sort of trying to like show himself to be the number one guy on a team and show that he is capable of elevating his team as their top player um but Evan uh what else does he need to do to to boost his odds yeah, I think he needs a couple more All-NBA selections or maybe a few more All-NBA selections. Um, I think he needs to step it up a little bit in that regard. And then, like you said, continue to just show that he can be a leader. Um, we saw on the Jazz, he is he has great liter- leadership skills. He can be that guy. Um, but now with the Cavaliers, he's been put in a position to kind of lead this young team and try to see if he can take him to the promised lands. Um I think he needs to play a little bit better and a little bit more consistent yeah. to get into the hall. Um, but he definitely, he absolutely has the talent to do it. Um, he's in no way a guy that I'm going to sit here and say, no, he's not going to be able to get in. Um, I think he just needs to kind of find his consistency, find his place on that Cavaliers team. And if he can man the helm and lead them through, I think he'll wind up having a good shot. 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, consistency is huge for him. Uh, that's one of the biggest plagues for him. Um, but yeah, if he can put it together, uh, could have a great career. Now, I did say um, Jason Tatum has the best shot of anyone that we were yet to list, and that's mostly because I forgot about Joel Embiid. <laughs> because why the hell is he down here? <laughs> um, why did they not even rank him? They didn't even give him, like, I think the minimum percentage that they had on their table was 0.0006% chance of making the Hall of Fame. And they didn't even give him that. And I don't know why. Um, because, like we mentioned earlier, if you win an MVP, it is almost a guarantee to be in the Hall already. One person ever has yet to make the Hall of Fame. And they're still eligible. They could do it. Um, on top of that, three all-defensive teams, five All-NBA selections, two-time scoring champion, like... This is an impressive resume already at such a young age. I mean, he could retire today, and I give him really good odds of making it um, and just continue to play a little bit longer at this level. Um, maybe focus more on a ring than on a uh, MVP trophy next year, and um, who knows? He might elevate his odds even better, but this I, I don't. Basketball reference, you guys do a lot of great things. I don't know what you're doing here. Yeah, agreed. Um, even more so than Jason Tatum, if he just continues to play, to play the way that he's been playing, and honestly, he could get even a little bit worse than the way that he's been playing, <laughs> and he would still likely wind up yeah. in the hall. I think at this point, it really just comes down to him playing a few more years, just for that you know claim on you know making it to 30 years old and the longevity thing. But he's won an MVP. He has a great all-around game. Um, him and Jokic absolutely battling it out year in, year out for the best big man in the NBA. And so I think at this point he's he's pretty much in. It's just a matter of him playing some more years. Yeah, I think so. And then the next guy also left off of the list, and I also think that was a mistake, though I probably wouldn't put him very high for, like, retire today, get in odds. I maybe only put him at around like three to five percent for that but it's not zero uh Luka Doncic with four all-nba selections uh four all-star appearances a rookie of the year award um just incredible resume for a young guy um who is hoping to continue to elevate his team uh sort of plays a lot like the finals mvp this year of Nikola Jokic just at a little bit smaller size, a little bit more of the actual um, primary ball handler in his offense. And I think, for me, he has all of the talent, all of the intelligence. It almost comes down to, in my mind, um, the front office making the right decisions to put the right players around him. Because we saw what can happen when a front office is intelligent with team building and chemistry. Um, with the 2023 Denver Nuggets and we saw what happens when a front office has no idea what it takes to build around this style of player with the 2022-2023 Dallas Mavericks um, so honestly I almost have the front office as one of his bigger hurdles to overcome but um, what's up, what's uh, your thoughts on this Evan? Yeah I, I agree with you. He absolutely has the talent and the ability to do so. Um, if he continues to play at the level he's been playing, he's going to have a good shot. Um, probably need, obviously needs to get some more accol accolades um, in his trophy case there. But incredibly talented guy, can absolutely make it. He just needs to be given the chance, essentially, by the Dallas Mavericks. And so far, they haven't really given him that chance. Yeah, for sure. And one last player, uh, someone who I probably wouldn't have included on this list, uh, but I guess, Evan, I'll throw it over to you since you had him written down. Uh, what do you think of Trey Young's chances? Come on, we had to have one guy on here that we just say absolutely flat out <laughs> no to. Um, sorry, I'm a Trey Young hater. Uh, Trey Young, no. Um, <laughs> I, he's a talented shooter, I guess. Um, but hasn't been able to elevate the Hawks. 
Um, really hasn't shown the ability to be very clutch, at least on a consistent basis. Um, struggles with a consist- consistency on a night-to-night basis of how much, how many points he's able to give you, the kind of productions he's able to give you. Um, and he is very young, so who knows? Maybe he turns it around a little bit, but uh, I, I don't think so on on Trey. Yeah, I mean he's not terribly worse than very early career Steph, but um, also he is not on that trajectory at all. Like Steph overcame a lot to become such a dominant shooter, playmaker, distributor, um, and. I'm not sure I fully see that in Trey Young. Um, he can certainly put in the work and hope to rise, um, but I don't think that he's currently on trajectory to have much of a shot at the uh, Hall of Fame. He will need to course correct a little bit if he wants to get there. But that is enough of the NBA talk because. That was just way too much. Now on over to the <laughs> NFL and our continuation of our division record predictions. Um, we'll be doing the AFC North today. Um, for those who don't know what teams are in the AFC North, because uh, I oftentimes have to Google it. It is the Bengals, <laughs> Ravens, Browns, and the Steelers. Um, good old blue-collar football over there. So, Jonathan, who do you got as your division winner? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned blue-collar football, and I think that's pretty apt. I think that um, this is going to be a a really difficult division for everybody uh, with all four of their defenses actually being pretty strong, um, also like gaining a little bit more health from last year and just uh, not really losing that many key pieces from any of these defenses. Um, A lot of these offenses as well are ranked pretty highly with well-built offensive lines. Um, Steelers are uh, fairly young at that offensive line, uh, but uh, starting to rise as well, and they're probably the worst one in the whole division. Um, I think it's going to be a very difficult year uh, for all of these teams, and um, the, the team that I see coming out on top is just the team that has one of the better set up schedules for themselves as well as um, I think a lot of talent on the offensive side of the ball that is going to get a strong chance to prove themselves this year Um, and that is the Baltimore Ravens Um, I I kept fishing for a couple more losses for them because I think that the number that I have here is a little bit ridiculous Um, just it's a huge rise from last year but at the same time um I think that they, a lot of these teams that they're facing at home, uh, they are simply better than. A lot of these teams that uh, they are facing on the road um, are like coming off of certain uncertainties and um, just it, it. They are in the driver's seat so long as like chemistry and things don't get in the way. Um, just a couple losses on the season to especially talented teams. I like it. Um, On my end, and I I agree. I think the the AFC North is going to wind up challenging the AFC West for the most hard-fought division in all of football. Um, you got a lot of good teams here. Um, But I'm going to go with the Bengals, continuing to lead this division at 12-5. and Um, Really, everybody in this division is catching a break by playing the NFC West this year um, with – depending on who you are, arguably two to three teams who are an absolute mess. So that makes their schedule a little bit easier. Um, but I think the Bengals, with their offensive capabilities, especially the fact that, gosh, they have T. Higgins as a wide receiver two, um, which is just yeah. nuts. Um, their offense is stacked. Again, this year they continue to improve upon that offensive line, um, give Joe Burrow the protection he needs. That defense, very good. Um, I think Zach Taylor is a fantastic head coach, kind of an underrated head coach in the NFL, honestly. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, so I think the Bengals will be able to continue their uh, their reign of the AFC North. Yeah, I like it. And uh, they are definitely my number two in this division. Um, I sort of thought going into this that they'd come out on top, but uh, just a couple of really difficult matchups, uh, having to play against uh, the Chiefs, which... 
Uh, no one else in this division is playing against, having to play against the Bills as well. Um, just a couple of really difficult opponents, um, and I sort of have them slipping a little bit in the late season as a result of just difficult schedules. Um, really strong coaching, uh, really strong um, offense, uh, probably, and this is uh, not a huge slide against them, but probably the weakest defense in the division. Uh, but still a great, de- like still a great defense above average. Will be able to hold its own against a lot of out of division opponents. Um, so they should have a lot of success. Definitely make a wild card and uh, push for some uh, postseason wins as well. Yeah, and I have. We just flipped our one and two. I have the Ravens as my second, coming in at eleven and six, one game back behind the Bengals. Um, you probably right. I think the Ravens do have a slightly easier schedule than the Bengals. Um, I just believe the Bengals will be able to push through, but I think the Ravens are going to do fantastic as well. Um, my main concern with the Ravens is that they do have some uncertainty when it comes to wide receivers. Not that they don't have a lot of options. It's actually quite the opposite. That they now have a ton of options, all of whom have not really played with Lamar Jackson. Um, so I think there is going to be some growing pains there for figuring out who his favorite targets are. Um, it'll take Zay Flowers a little bit of time to get up to speed. OBJ is new in the system. Um, Lamar still has Mark Andrews, but Mark Andrews can only do so much. Um, and they, as per usual, don't really have much in the way of running backs. So I, I see some growing pains at the beginning of the season. Um, but I think the Ravens pick it up and wind up finishing out 11-6 to make take a wild card spot. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting season for that team. A team that thought that they were going to lose Lamar Jackson this offseason. And they were able to hold on, pick up a stud in Zay Flowers, who you and I both love, and uh, see if they can sort of uh, make it back to the playoffs this year. Um, But on to my third team in this division, which is the Browns. Um, It's a tough team for me to pick, partially because of, like, how strong the division is, partially because because of um, like Deshaun Watson uh, sort of coming off a uh, long absence into a somewhat underwhelming um, last few games last year. And I think that he does start to bounce back a little bit, but I think it's also going to be pretty difficult to put it together in year one uh, or like year one and a half, if you want to call it that. So, um couple of uh, tough losses within the division um, and uh, still able to pull it out with a winning record but I don't think that just a winning record is enough to make it uh, to a wild card spot in this AFC yeah I also have the Browns at, Browns at third but I have the Browns also going 11 and 6 and I, I totally understand having the Bengals 12 and 5 Ravens 11 and 6 and Browns 11 and 6 is not really realistic um But like you said, the Browns are just so hard to predict. Um, They have an absolutely stacked defense. They have a lot of weapons on offense. So if Deshaun Watson is able to come in and be his Houston Texans self, this Browns team will be very scary. Um, I also think the Browns definitely benefit from the fact that a lot of their challenging games are at home. So they do have home, home field advantage against like the Jets and the Jaguars and the 49ers. Um, teams who on the road I probably would have picked losses for the Browns but at home I think I give the Browns the edge so um, these top three teams Bengals Ravens Browns really come the end of the year I would not be shocked no matter what order they wound up falling Um, they all have fantastic potential and could absolutely win this division yeah I think so I think the biggest reserve, reservation for me is that I just don't think the Browns know how to win yet. And they could put mm-hmm. it together this year, but like I have them eating a couple of losses to teams that seem to know how to win, even if they might be a little bit outclassed in talent. And mm-hmm. we'll see if that is truly a factor this year. Um, but I think that the Browns have some demons that they need to conquer if they want to make the playoffs. But now for uh, my final pick in this division, and I think it's the same as yours, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
uh, it's still a really solid record, finishing eight and nine. I think my biggest reservation about them, because uh, they have a great O line, they got a great defense, some uh, solid pieces on offense, um, but still a young quarterback trying to find his way in the league, and uh, somewhat of a new feel in their organization as a result. So having such a tough challenge of division and uh, schedule outside of that as well, it's going to be a difficult year for them, and I have them just barely with a losing record at 8-9, and nine, uh, missing playoffs, but having some things to look forward to um, in the future with their franchise. Yeah, I'm a little bit more down on the Steelers than you are. I have them going 6-11, and 1-5 um, in, in the division. Like you said, it's, it's brutal for them that they're in <laughs> the AFC North. Um, I had them losing to the Bengals and the Ravens twice because I just think those teams are so much better than them. Um, I also don't really have a ton of faith in Kenny Pickett. Um, the flashes that we saw from him last year, he seems like, I feel like his ceiling is mediocre quarterback at best. Um, and with the current set of weapons that the Steelers have, um, I'm just not sure I see Kenny Pickett being able to elevate them very much. So I have them going 6-11. and 11. Uh, Mike Tomlin's what just second now losing record ever as a head coach so yeah an an impressive tenure as head coach and I think that that's a lot of the reason that I give them a couple of extra wins is um just I think that he will be able to like elevate his team a little bit higher than they probably should go at this point in time but yeah um moving on now from uh football to our final segment of the day Finally, I know, I know we're taking a long time this time, but (laughs) (laughs) it's time for our betting segment, uh, starting out with our 100 units bets. Um, Evan, why don't you go ahead and kick us off there? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go with uh, Florida Panthers money line here in the Stanley Cup at uh, plus 164. I'll take those odds at a half a unit, so I think the Panthers will be able to pull out this game here. Yeah, I think that's a decent one. I was uh, I was almost tempted to say Panthers uh, just win the series outright, but plus like 640 wasn't sweet enough for me to do that. I do like them on the money line for this game, though. Um, on to my 100 units bet. I just want to ride high. I want to double down. Uh, so Denver Nuggets 2024 <laughs> champions. <laughs> it's a... Uh, Plus 460 implied odds of around 20%. And I think that uh, continuity and um, like just the talent of these players, their youth, are huge strengths. I think one of the biggest concerns to that is uh, the Phoenix Suns, and it is also injuries. We'll need to be able to overcome both of those challenges next year. But I do think that this team is more than capable of doing that. And I just want to ride it right now, so going for them as my champions next year. I like it. For my 10,001 bets, and uh, this is now going to be the time of year where our 10,001s get a bit wacky because we no longer have football, (laughs) we no longer have basketball. So I guess I'm going to be riding on baseball. Um, I'm going to go money lines for a few different teams for tomorrow night, Wednesday I'm picking Brewers, Giants, Mets, Angels, Nationals, and Phillies to all win tomorrow night. That's plus 13,527, doing a quarter of a unit. All right. Yeah, like you said, I I honestly thought about making our betting segment the dick of the week. (laughs) (laughs) Just because I'm not a baseball guy, and hockey is nearly done. I didn't love any of the bets around hockey this time around. Uh, which means that I'm really just shoot. I'm either doing long-term bets right now, or I'm shooting in the dark. And to reflect that, let's put let's bet on some cricket. <laughs> um, I know nothing about cricket. Don't do this. But uh, I'm going the home teams on the 16th of June: uh, Worcester, Middlesex, <laughs> Yorkshire, Dunham, uh, Northamp- Northamptonshire. I mean, how can you lose with a name like Northamptonshire? Uh, Somerset, Essex, and Sussex. Plus 41,155. And I'm just going to 
uh, go ahead and throw that quarter of a unit right into the trash can um, pretty much every week for the rest of the summer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but maybe I'll have to learn how to watch baseball, and then I can start betting on those games as well. It's it's a lot of fun, man. Come on. <laughs> it does seem like fun. It's just, I don't know. I can't do it on TV. I probably need to like join a fantasy league if I want to really get into it, because that's really how I... That's how I got really familiar with baseball or with uh, basketball and football originally. Because I've always been a mm-hmm. fan of the sport. I knew teams overall, but to get to player level to be able to understand what's going on, that it really helps me to like force myself to study it by putting money down. Yeah. So maybe I do that because we've got a sports podcast and we got to talk about something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> But that's all the time that we have for today, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. And Evan, why don't you go ahead and send us out? As much as it pains me to say it, the New York Mets are going to be finishing last in the National League East this year. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Good night, everybody.